my message is called Rise and Shine. Rise and shine. We hear that in the mornings a lot of times in our popular media and uh, Dunkin' Donuts and all those people that want us to rise and shine and eat a donut. Um, but I want to talk this morning about that under that umbrella. And first of all, a couple thoughts came to me this morning as I was getting ready. Um, the first was to really just keep celebrating your season. Celebrate the season you're in. It's so easy to sort of gloss over where we are, but a friend of mine who's a psychotherapist, she always says, these are the good old days. These are the good old days. In other words, we're gonna look back on this season with all its trials, tears, and troubles, and there are gonna be fond memories for most of us, because why? We're making our life count. And even in the mundane, even in the difficult things, it triggered in my mind because this morning I woke up in this hotel room at the Marriott, lovely room, and I honestly felt like I was kind of having a spa weekend. And the reason is, is because I have five-year-old toddler twin girls and a husband and busy life. And normally whenever I travel, for the most part, except when I go out and speak, I'm always with them now. And, and, and daily in my home, I literally get woken up. Do you ever miss just sleeping in? Oh, don't we miss that? Interestingly, though, I traveled for so many years by myself before I was married, doing women's conferences, speaking for corporate events, and I was always by myself. And so often in hotel rooms, I felt lonely. But now in hotel rooms, oh, I'm loving that. <laughs> All by myself. Nobody waking me up. So see, the key is to celebrate your season. Because your season's going to change. Sometimes our health changes, our, our family demographics change, but if we celebrate our season, then every season will bring its joy. Amen. So keep celebrating your season. The other thing is, I mentioned it last night, but I just want to remind you this morning with a simple story about being a woman who's a steward over the gifts and the dreams in our hearts. We as women are really stewards, and when I clued into that concept of stewardship, it started helping me carve out time sometimes away from my kids or my family, like this weekend. The girls started crying the other night, Mommy, don't leave, I miss you when you go, and you know, the typical routine. And, and that would cause great anxiety in my spirit if I did not know that this is also part of my assignment. So when you're on assignment, you can make those tough choices without feeling guilty all the time. I was driving our youngest son, John Luke, who today is his birthday. He's turning 26. He's our youngest of our four boys. And I remember driving him home from a sleepover one Saturday. Now, he must have been about 13, and he had spent the night with some of his guy friends. And I went to pick him up. And I had mentioned last night the boys weren't talking a lot during this season of adjusting to our blended family. But he was talking this on this Saturday morning. We were coming back home, and he just starts talking. Here's what he says. He says, you know... All my friends are going to grow up to be just like their parents. You know, so-and-so, he's going to be an attorney because his mom's an attorney. And, and the other guy is probably going to go to law school because his dad's a lawyer. He said, and then I look at all of us boys. Nathan is living in Scotland, part of a church plant over there. And Christian's doing this summer thing in New York City. Jordan loves Israel and is doing, has a vision to go and do some things in Israel, which he ended up doing. And he said, to me... I'm going to be a rock star. <laughs> Very matter of fact, I was like, yeah. But here was the key of what he said. And he said, I think we boys do our dreams because we see you and dad doing your dreams. Now, isn't that a good moment? I, and I had to kind of keep myself calm, you know, and I'm like, interesting. Yeah, I wanted to go, yes, yes, that's it, that's it. But it really helped me because it made me realize that sometimes the best role modeling we could do is own our dreams and go do them. Bring our kids with us. I said to the girls, you know, probably starting next year, you'll get to travel with mommy some, and I'll take one or one of you with me some. Bring them along for the ride. Let them sit. Let them absorb. You know, Marla and I were talking last night about her kids and how they're finding their own path. And so many of your kids, Maria was telling me about her kids here at this church. This church is so perfect for getting your kids plugged in and experimenting with their dreams and their visions. Why? Because we are vision families. We have dreams, each of us, including the moms, the grandmas. 
the aunties, the godmothers, all of us, we have a dream and we're going for it. Some of it feels like one big grand experiment, but we don't care. Why? Because we're serving the King of Kings. And we're going to get in motion. And do you know something? A dream in motion attracts provision. Provision of time, thoughts, prayers. We move things out when we're dreaming big. Why? Because we don't have time to waste time. I get 10 minutes sometimes by myself. I'm going to work on that thing I'm working on. Why? Because I'm stewarding that dream. It may take me five years to get it done, but every little bit counts. Sometimes in my car, I turn off everything else, no headphones. When I run, I'm a big, avid runner. I run about six miles three times a week. And I've learned over the years to take nothing with me, no podcasts, no earphones. Why? Because that time for me, and you'll find your way, is when God can download things to me. And I need him downloading because I don't get a lot of concentrated focus time. But you'll find your ways of doing it. When Jordan, our son, was diagnosed with cancer and, and it came back the second time, he was in our home. And it was actually this was the first time he had had his surgery. He was going through radiation twice a day. He was in bed most of the time. It was a dark hour. And we felt like our house was nothing but a cancer fighting treatment center in many ways. But one night it hit me, I thought, you know, I've really been wanting to write this book for women that are single. What would I say? And I just took to my iPad or whatever I had, and I just started writing it. And I thought, well, this is kind of good. And before long, do you know I wrote my entire book, Remember the Roses, during Jordan's cancer journey? The most unlikely time that I would have thought. I would have never said, well, this is the time I'm going to start writing this book, right? We, need, we think we need big moments, big, big, I need to go away on a retreat and write my book. And, you know, sometimes just take it in pieces. And God will begin to download you. And before long, you just sit there and you go, wow. I talk about dreaming on all cylinders. Have a dream for every area of your life. Dreaming for my home, dreaming for the vacation, dreaming for my kids, dreaming for my professional life, dreaming for my spring wardrobe. What's it going to look like? And what do I want to add this year? All those little dreams tell our, li- our hearts we're living, not dying. We're alive. We're not retiring, Ron and I, because we're going to go out dreaming, dreaming big for God. So just a couple quick thoughts as a background for this morning. Let's dive in. Three elements to help you rise. We could call them agents, rising agents. The first one is your purpose. Your purpose. Purpose is like yeast. Any bakers in the bunch? I love to bake. In fact, I have a photo of my specialty. This is my specialty. Do we have that photo right here? There it is. Cinnamon rolls. I love cinnamon rolls. I'm not making them for my family. I'm making them for myself. (laughs) Let's just be clear on this. We like to eat the dough, um, but there's a key to good cinnamon rolls, right? The rise. The yeast. I took the recipe from the pioneer woman and I kind of tweaked it and made it my own and I've got this down to perfection if I do say so myself. And about three times a year I make a big big freezer full of cinnamon rolls and then we pull them out through the year. But yeast is the key. Now the yeast you cannot see. When it gets incorporated you don't look at your roll and go, oh, it looks like the yeast in there. But the agent of the yeast has created what, what needed to happen with the sugar and the flour and the, all the other good ingredients. And Jesus talks about us as children of the kingdom, as yeast, permeating the atmosphere, going where we need to go. Yeast, however, in this context I want to mention, is really like your life purpose. Now, there were two seasons in my life where purpose became really crucial for me. The first was right about 30 years old. Shared a little bit last night about my career path. Ended up at my alma mater, Oral Roberts University. I'm getting into my late 20s now, and I turned 30. Still not married. All my other friends getting promoted, getting big raises, having their kids, buying their first homes. And I'm just feeling stuck in a lot of ways. So I went to see a counselor. I believe in Christian counseling. I've been to Christian counseling numerous times in my life. And I went to see a counselor that I'd actually seen when I was a student at ORU because I was feeling... What he helped me realize was trapped. What do I do? How do I change my life? How do I get what I want out of my career? A career I really never wanted but wouldn't trade now. How do I meet the man that I want to meet? It's not happening the way I thought it would happen. Do you ever feel that? You feel stuck at junctures? Just kind of helpless. 
One of the discoveries that that counseling helped me see was I needed more definition on my bigger answer to the question, why? Why am I here? Every human heart will want to answer that question at some juncture. Why am I here? Secular, Christian, every heart is going to at some point need to answer the question, why? Maybe some people medicate their way away from the question. Deny the question, ignore the question, put so much con, you know, uh, convoluted thinking in their heads they'll never even pay attention. But the human heart at some point, at some place, will cry out, doesn't matter what your age, doesn't matter what your stage, you will cry out. And God has created you for a purpose, and he wants to help you know what that purpose is. Purpose answers the question, why? So I started going to work. I thought, I need a written purpose statement. Started messing around with it a little bit, got some ideas, um, had sort of a general sense of what it was. But then life got busy. I got the job at Deloitte, ended up moving to New York, and 9-11 happened. Now, meanwhile, I'm traveling quite a bit on the weekends, speaking for conferences, um, doing some of what I love. But there really wasn't doing anything like that professionally. And definitely no one at Deloitte knew that that's what I really love to do. I remember walking down the Marriott Hotel in Times Square where we had all been dispersed because all of our offices had been chaotic and wrecked from the 9-11 tragedies. I'm walking down the hall in the Marriott Marquis and I remember the spot and I thought to myself, no one at this firm really knows why I'm here. They don't know my vision, they don't know my passion. Do you ever feel like that at your job? Like here I am, this full Christian, godly woman, or this person with all these other talents that no, no part of my job description includes. You know, you're, you're a multidimensional woman. You're going to have many, many interests and ideas, and the more we grow deeper in God, the more blossoming we'll do. More branch is going to start to grow. Maybe you grew up in an area or a family that didn't really cultivate that, but you come into Jesus in a family like this, you're going to get stirred in a lot of new ways, and often it feels random. Amen. Man, I like to sing, but then I'm good at engineering or whatever your combo is. But I'm here to tell you, you dream on all cylinders because God will find creative ways to pull it in. And so I'm thinking this, and I thought, you know, my purpose statement, i got to get back to that. i got to really get defined in this season. So that's what I did. I finally wrote a personal purpose statement for my life, and here's what it is for me personally. My purpose is to inspire and motivate people to know their purpose and live their dreams. Now, nothing on my job description had anything to do with that. But what purpose will begin to do is it is like your GPS. It will start pointing you to projects, people, possibilities in your career, in your current job that have some relatability to your purpose. So the key for me was inspire and motivate. I love to do that. Yeah, I can teach. Yeah, I can structure things, but I love to just do what I'm doing. Hopefully this weekend, inspire and motivate you. Not just inspire you with new ideas, but to move you to do something. Amen. Motivate you. So that was a good clue, inspire and motivate. So I started looking around my job description. I thought, where are there ideas, projects, possibilities at work? And thought about a new initiative the firm was making and, and asked if I could get more involved in that and started running these team meetings where I got to inspire and motivate the team serving our big clients on how to go get more business with the clients. Well, by the time I left the firm after eight years, they had actually created a position just for me doing just that working with some of the most difficult teams at the firm who were having the hardest time penetrating new business and putting Lynette Lewis with the partner in charge and doing sessions to try to strategize around our business objectives. Now, it wasn't that like this. This is my real favorite thing. But it was so much more aligned with my purpose. It didn't happen overnight, but it took some years. But see, purpose starts directing you. Another interesting thing, one day I'm having a conversation with a guy who'd moved from my team at work to HR. And he's now in the HR department. And I said to him one day, he goes, what are you working on? I said, you know, I've had this idea, Jeff. What if we could take employee groups at Deloitte, one of the biggest firms in the world, what if we could take a group of employees and get them to all write their life purpose statement and then align it with the job that they have now? I think they'd be more motivated. I think they'd be more inspired. We're on the Fortune's 50 Most Admired Companies list, which says if you're going to work at any company in America, go work for one of these. We're Deloitte. We're on the list. And he said, yeah, and the problem is that when we're on the list, people think, well, what have they done for me lately? 
So it creates an appetite for more, but we don't always know how to do it. So he said, this idea really intrigues me. Would you be willing to sit down with the HR director? I said, sure. Now, when I, when I tell you the rest of the story, let me tell you, fear, trepidation, every step of the way. Like, what am I doing? I have no idea what I'm doing. Oh, yes, that'd be a great idea. Like, you're faking it till you make it, right? So we sit down with the HR director. He's like, I'm very intrigued with this idea. How would you do it? What would it look like? I said, and I, I would just start talking. It's almost like an out-of-body experience. I'm just giving ideas. I'm thinking, I hope that works. I hope he likes that. Before long, we did a class, and, and he said, what would you call it? I said, leading on purpose. And we got 15 people together. We had them handpicked by the partners in charge, the most high-performing individuals who were most at risk for being recruited away from the firm. We put them, men and women, through a six-week course. By the way, when I told my boss, who was head of marketing, that I was thinking about doing this, he goes, absolutely no way. He's like, you're one of my top people. I can't afford to, for you to take the time to do this. Expect closed doors when you're moving forward. Just expect it, because you will get it. And I, I thought about it that night, and I came back to him a day or two later. I said, Paul, tell you what. I will work on this evenings and weekends. I'll take no, none of my work time to do this, but it's so important to me. And by the way, I'm in marketing, and we don't get a lot of training. Let's just consider this my training for the year. He kind of laughed. He's like, I don't know how I can say no. Keep me informed. Okay, I'll let you do it. So sure enough, when I needed some special speakers for the class, I had my boss come in. I had the most important partners of the firm come in. I thought, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to get seen by the people that matter. And I'm going to get into that in just a minute. And do you know, the woman who's in charge of training and development told us after the first season of this class, she said, we got the highest marks on this class of any training program we've ever done. Now, can you imagine how much I was loving Deloitte at that point? Not because I love my marketing job, but because I was finding creative ways to put the firm to work for me. And my challenge for you this morning is put your job to work for you. Put your network of people to work for you. Put your dreams to work for you. And find creative ways. The more you do this, it's like a muscle group. You will get so good at doing this. People will say, how in the world do you get so many promotions, so many jobs? Why? You're just taking the yeast of your purpose, and you're just finding ways to include it in everything. But it starts with that definition. The first chapter of my book is how to write a purpose statement. Easy exercises that I've now delivered all over the country to every team that I've been a part of, to the boards that I've left, everyone that I know. If you're in my circle, you're going to write a personal purpose statement. We did a, a workshop as an outreach at our church in New York City about a month and a half ago. And we had over 120 people sign up just like that to come to this workshop, young and old, men and women, students, ladies that were about to retire, and, and the people in the church used it as an outreach because guess why? So many people they work with are searching for purpose. And we all came together. We wrote our purpose statements. Everybody, I mean, the buzz in the room was like unbelievable. One woman works at the UN. She said, I want to be an ambassador, but I'm an engineer and I'm having such a hard time. And we got the definition and the connection for her. And she has written me, she is on fire to be at the UN, to do the job that doesn't yet fit because she knows where she's going. Do you know somebody that needs purpose? Help them find it. Purpose is the yeast, and it makes all the difference. You will have one purpose in life, but you'll have many missions. What are missions? Missions answer the question, what? What will I go do? Well, I have many missions. Wife, mom, multiple missions within my career, at church, as a volunteer, in the community, as a daughter, as a friend. But through it all, the weaving thing is when Lynette shows up, she inspires and motivates. And I want people to know their purpose and live their dreams. And so it, it, it feels like it will narrow your vision and actually, actually it will make you more impactful than you've ever been in your life. Let's move on to the second one. The second element that will help you rise is what I call a rising tide a rising tide. I'm fascinated with the tides in the ocean. I love the ocean. When you live in North Carolina, we divide our time between North Carolina and New York City. And in New York, we're right on the water, but in, in North Carolina, we have amazing beaches, and that's our fun thing to do one week every year. We go to the beach in, uh, on the coast of the Atlantic Ocean. And I'm fascinated with tides because what's going on? I mean, how does the water know to come in, and it rises, and then it goes out, and it's an interesting... I did a little mini study on it. It's gravitational pull from the sun and the moon. And then 
um, how they all relate to the spinning of the earth. I mean, God is just so amazing, isn't he? I mean, when you dive into nature, boy, it reminds you how big he is. And my problems are so small for my big, amazing God. But someone told me years ago when I was frustrated with not getting promoted, I heard this, this statement, this statement, a rising tide lifts all boats. A rising tide lifts all boats. So over the course of my path, I started becoming more strategic about being where the tide is rising. Like this morning, by coming to this, the tide is rising, right? Oxygen's coming in. There's a lift coming, choosing to be in those places with those people, in those environments where the tide is rising. How does that practically turn into what we do at work? Well, where are they putting the money at your job right now? Who are the key players? Do you notice who they are that are getting the attention? Become friends with them, or at least be friendly with them. There were some handful of women at Deloitte & Touche that I began to recognize were getting positions of, of serving in the National Women's Initiative and other things. And when I married Ron and I was trying to think, how am I going to do this job? I had my resignation later, letter in hand. I talked to one of those women that I had befriended along the way. And I explained to her, I said, I'm really sad. I'm, I'm probably just going to have to leave. i got to start traveling more. i got to do a reduced schedule. And she goes, let me make one phone call before you turn in your resignation. She called the woman that was the head of the National Women's Initiative, and within a matter of just a couple days, they had created a brand new marketing position for me where I could work from anywhere I wanted to three days a week. Now, in eight years of working at Deloitte, I had five different positions. All I attribute to being where the tide is rising going to a conference, making sure I'm talking to someone, walking through the big World Financial Center. They call it the garden area where everybody goes to have lunch. And one day, I was just in there having lunch, and the firm has about 3,000 people in the New York region, and I saw the chairman of the, of the New York firm going up the escalator. And I'd never met him. Bill Frieda is his name. And I thought, I need to, he kind of needs to know me. I need to know him. And I just walked over, and I go, excuse me, Bill? And he goes, yes. And I said, I'm Lynette Lewis. I work for Paul Kahn and the marketing team. I just want to thank you for the voicemail messages that you send out periodically where you're updating us on what's going on in the firm. I appreciate it. It just really helps me feel connected to your vision. And I just want to thank you. It really makes a difference. And he's like, well, thank you. You know, and he goes up and, and I go back to work. I'm sitting at my cubicle and my, pretty soon my boss walks over and he goes, hey, I heard you met Bill Frieda. And I said, yeah. He goes, well, that's pretty cool. And, and I said, well, what did he say? And he said, yeah, he just said that he met you at lunch. And I said, yeah, great. And he walks on and I thought, see there? Get where the tide is rising. Yeah. Insert yourself. Now, was I just, you know ecstatic over these voicemails that Bill Frieda was sending out? No. I appreciated them, though. I wasn't lying. But ask the Holy Spirit to show you where is the tide rising? Who are the people you need favor with? Insert yourself into the mix. Not because, again, you're not being arrogant, presumptuous. You're being a steward over the woman of God that you are. You do not know where God wants to invite you next. And knowing the right people is so key and so important. Amen. In God, there are places and moments where things are happening. Get in those moments. That's why coming to this conference, I'm preaching to the choir. You are here on a Saturday morning. You are in where the tide is rising. You are in Destiny World Outreach Center. This church, the tide is rising. Things are happening here. Be here. Be a part of it. Even just the, the spillover is going to make a big, big difference. Amen. Then the last element that will help us rise. So the first is knowing our purpose, which is the yeast that helps us rise. The second is be where the tide is rising. Be in the environments, be in the atmosphere. And the last piece is, the last element that I want to mention is the right people. That sounds so obvious, right? But the right people at the right time helping you do the right things is how you're going to be right where you belong. I think of the story, one of my favorite stories, there's so many in the Bible, but do you remember the story of the man who needed to get healed, but, that, but Jesus was in a house and it was so packed out, crowded, that they couldn't get the man in? 
So these friends broke through the roof and lower him through the roof in front of Jesus. And you know the story Jesus says, looks at their faith, and they're like, rise up and walk. Now, I think about those friends. I mean, they are amazing. They go over to the guy's house. They're like, we're taking you to Jesus. Uh, I mean, can you imagine what he thought? Maybe, I mean, maybe he's excited. Maybe he thought, well, you know, if you're laying and you're sick, you don't always feel motivated to go get what you need. But you have friends that know where to take you. And they pick you up and they carry you through and then they can't get in. Bummer. Oh, well, I guess the timing wasn't right. No, those friends don't take that for an answer. They go crawling up on top of that roof. They start damaging personal property <laughs> to get you before Jesus. Amen. Oh, there have been so many times I've needed my friends to just carry me to the throne room of God. Sick of praying about my same things over and over. Don't you get sick of your own prayer life sometimes? I mean, for years and years praying for this husband to come along, and my sweet best friend Tony had her 10 children. She was so busy, not one time I called her did she not take my call. And I'd be crying, usually after one of those bad 65 blind dates. I mean, I was always, I was better off having no dates than bad dates, you know. They reminded me of what wasn't working in my life. And calling Tony and just crying about the same thing. And, and she would just, every single time, I'd say, I'm so sorry to be calling you about this thing again. She's like, I figure if you're sick of it, Lynette, I don't, I'm not sick of it. If you're, you must be bearing it worse. I mean, she always had the right thing to say. I mean, she looked at me one day, we were having breakfast, and I said to her, Tony, I'm telling you, I cannot wait one more year. I cannot. I'm just telling you, I cannot wait one more year. Do you ever say that about a miracle you need? Maybe in your marriage, maybe in your finances, maybe in your health. I mean, we feel that way, don't we? Get, we get desperate. We're like, I cannot do this one more day. Not one more week, not one more year for sure. I don't know. I must have been like maybe 30 at the time. Thank goodness the Lord doesn't tell us how long we have. We think it's like a 3K, then we think it's a 5K, and we find out it's a marathon. <laughs> oh, I love the Lord for keeping it secret, even though I was so mad at him for so long for doing that. But Tony looked at me that morning, and she said, Lynette, do you think you can wait two more weeks? And I was like, yeah, I probably could wait two more weeks. She says, then you wait two more weeks. And that really helped me. Someone in here, you're waiting on something. And I'm here this morning. You just, just wait one more day. Wait one more week. God is working. Oh, I'm so glad I waited till I was 42 to get the grand prize, Ron Lewis. We've been married 15 years. It's coming December. I mean, amazing what God will do for you. And when we got together, we found out we'd been reading the same books on marriage. We'd been going to similar conferences. We were so surprised we'd never met. He had so much loss. He had so much devastation when he ended up in a divorce after 20 years of marriage, a divorce he never wanted, that he fought for, that he believed for for years and years and years, and nothing he could do would change the outcome. And finally, all he could do was let her have what she wanted. Praise God, we get along great. She and I have been friends. We fought together for Jordan's healing. We've, I mean, I love her. But God had to write a new chapter and a new story. And my friend Tony and so many of my other girlfriends helped me wait. We need friends like that. I went to a women's conference, a kind of a workshop for two days, a secular kind of corporate women's conference. And in that conference met, there were five of us that kind of clicked. We sort of ended up having lunch together and we really hit it off. And we decided at the end of the two days that we would get together once a month for lunch. We just thought it might be a good idea. We'll advance our dreams. We'll help each other. Didn't know each other really at all before this, but that's what we started doing. So once a month for two years, we would trade around each other's offices, go to lunch at each other's place of work. Whoever we went to, they hosted us with simple sandwiches or whatever. And here's all we did over that lunch hour. Very simple process. I'm sharing it with you because you may want to use it. We took whatever time we had, an hour and a half. We divided it up evenly. We had a timekeeper. Each person got their equal amount of time. Why? So no one would dominate. I'm a dominator. I can tend to be a dominator. 
We all been in those groups where someone dominates, right? Nothing wrong. There are times when one person needs it. But it's better when you're being strategic to give everyone their time. Because then every time, everyone wants to come. I'm just being, I'm breaking it down for you. This is how it works. And so every time we would have lunch, we'd go around the circle and we'd answer two questions. Here's what I'm working on. Here's what I need. Over that two-year period, each one of us so advanced our dreams. Because I would be sitting there saying, I want to develop a purpose program. I think there's value to it. My friend Deborah would say, do you have an attorney? You might want to think about copywriting. You're working at Deloitte. What is the balance between what they own and what you own? And giving me things. And then I'd come back the next month, and I'd be talking about something. They'd say, now, why didn't you call that attorney? I gave you her name. And there's accountability. There's motivation. Now, I will be honest with you. One time in the two-year period, these sweet friends of mine, who for the most part were not of the same inclination faith-wise as I was, one of them said, now, excuse me, but today I really, really, really want to talk about something. And everybody's like, yeah. And she's like, I want to talk about why Lynette's not married. <laughs> and one of them goes, I want to talk about that too. <laughs> now, Lynette, what are you really looking for? And we spent the whole hour and a half, and they were doing their best to try to help me. Well, you know, are you going out? Are you seeing people? And do you know when those other four or five women were at my wedding, all of them dancing a lot on that dance floor. <laughs> they were ecstatic. They were flipped. Why? Because they had a little bit of a hand, right? Not that much, but, you know, they, they helped own it. Now, the point is this. Every dream needs a team. Every dream needs a team. John Maxwell first said, said that. You need a team, I would suggest, in your professional pursuits. You definitely need a dream, for, a dream team for your prayers and things you're believing for, every dream needs a team. And these teams will help you get where you need to go. I wanna show you a picture of my team in New York City. This was a number of years ago. Um, there, it's kinda of hard to see, it's a little dark, but we're all basically sitting at one of our team meetings. Um, everybody's got a little tiny blue Tiffany blue box. I bought them all a Tiffany mug that year. This is my team, mostly volunteers at our church in New York City, all of us getting together a couple times a year to run the women's ministry and do some things at the church. Um, I don't think anybody's on staff except maybe one other person's on staff, mostly volunteers. And we got together every year, and because I'm big about purpose, I would say you gotta define for the whole group one dream you're gonna pursue this year. One woman wanted to run a marathon, others had all these dreams, and it was during the season I was going through infertility, and they knew I was believing for babies, and they walked me through my miscarriage, and then I shared with them that the year I wrote in my journal, I'm going to be a double portion, I'm a double portion woman, I'm going to have twin baby girls, and I talked about that last night. Their names would be Victoria, Joy, Isabella, Grace, blah, blah, blah. So they laid hands on me, and then every year we'd get back together, and you know, frankly, I moved on from that dream. Didn't let it go, but it was on the back burner. I had other things to do. And a couple years later, we're having our team meeting, and Tina, at the end, one of the women in the picture, she pipes up and she goes, Lynette, you know, you, have, you really haven't brought it up in a while, but I just really felt led to give you a gift. And she pulls out a girl's Christmas baby bib. And she's like, I just wanted you to know, you haven't talked about it in a while, but I've not let go of your dream. At which point, Deborah, my other friend, starts screaming, and she's like, oh my word, I can't believe this, I bought a gift too. And she pulls out a little gift bag, and it had two baby winter scarves and hats, pink ones. At which point, Tina, the first woman, starts screaming even louder. She goes, I can't even believe this. I actually bought you two Christmas bibs, but I thought this is so mean and torturous if it's not God, and I left one in the car. <laughs> but I'll get it for you afterwards. And now they all start just going, oh, my word, oh, my word. One of them says, Lynette, this is like your faith baby shower. Now, in my heart, I'm like, oh, these sweet women, they don't even know. I've kind of really had to let this go and move on. But they were tenacious, and they were praying. They were like those people taking you in through the roof. And we prayed together. Well, a couple years went by. Nothing was happening. But my sweet friend Marge, she's my chief intercessor. She was in that group. She would call me and leave me voicemails. And I didn't ever pick up when Marge called because I wanted it to go to voicemail. Because she would say things like this, oh, Lynette. I heard those baby girls laughing this morning. I heard them laughing. Then the next time she'd say, 
I don't know where you're at, Lynette, but today you're not letting go. No, 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 you're not letting go. You're going to hold on because God is going to do this. Oh, you're not letting go. I don't care how old you are. I know you had a birthday this week. I don't care about that. You're going to get what God has for you. He lets me hear these babies. They laugh all the time. And those babies, they're coming. I'm telling you, they're coming. And do you know when you have tenacious friends and you have no faith for yourself, you can just let go of where you're at and you say, then I'm going to lean on your faith. When we got word from that young woman, when my first, we got word from my friend who knew her and, said, and called and said, do you and Ron still want twin baby girls? And I'm like, you know, my husband ain't never going to go for this. And, she, and I said, Deanna, I don't know. And she said, well, it's going to be a long shot, Lynette, and I don't want you to get your hopes up. But what I did not know is Deanna rallied five, probably five of my girlfriends, many of whom were in that room, and they started praying around the clock. She said to them, it's going to take a miracle for this young woman to change her mind from the first family who wanted the boy, and then, more importantly, to choose Ron and Lynette. But I believe these are Ron and Lynette's babies, and we're going to pray them in. And these women, unbeknownst to me, started texting each other, getting words from God, started praying around the clock. And inch by inch, little things began to happen, and then one family weren't sure, and then this happened, and all that. And before long, I started getting clued. They're praying, and they're like, you don't need to worry about it. You don't need to know what we're doing. You just move on, do your part, get your paperwork updated. Well, sure enough, when that young woman picked Ron and I, I knew my midwives delivered those babies into our family. Because every knee, every team, every dream needs a team. And they became my dream team. Who can you hook up with? Maybe it's someone obvious. Oftentimes, it's someone new who's not emotionally attached to all your reasons why it can't work or won't work or your issues with your husband that you're praying about or your issues with your job. It gets a fresh new set of eyes, and you simply say, do you, would you want to do what Lynette talked about? Let's start getting together. And remember, everybody gets equal time. Here's what I'm working on. Here's what I need. And I talk about this in my book. And one other idea for you is what I call a personal board of directors. It's a way to frame who you need in your life to get to your next dream. I have a whole chapter in my book about it. A personal board is not people you ask to serve on your board. It is simply a structure for you viewing what gaps you have in advancing your dream. When I wanted to become more of a paid speaker, I needed a website. I need a website committee. I needed a finance committee. Why? Because it was going to cost me money to do some of those things. I made my dad chairman of the finance committee because he cared more than anybody else about my financial solvency at this point. So in my mind, I thought, I'm going to rely on dad, his discernment, his prayers. It, it structures your dream. Why do I tell you these tactics? Because most of us have dreams and no plan. Your plan is so crucial, and it will help you advance. One last story about the right people. When my book came out, I was doing a mini book tour um, around different places, speaking on the book, and I did a, a women's event in Washington, D.C. It was put on by a friend of a friend, and a number of young women came. It was kind of a small signing. I wondered if it had really been worth the time, but it was enjoyable at a woman's house, um, and a lot of young women, up-and-comers in Washington, D.C. Two of them worked for Mrs. Laura Bush in her office in a staff role, not a big, high role, but over five years later, one of them called me one day. Her name's Charity. She said, Lynette, I don't know if you remember me. I was with so-and-so. I came to your book signing. I've become the chief of staff, um, a senior staff or, uh, advisor for Mrs. Laura Bush. They're now living in Texas, as you know. They're, now they had left the White House. Their time was over. She said, I'm working for her. I'm her senior advisor. And they, as a part of the presidential library and, and center that they're building, they want to start a women's initiative. And I'm a believer, and I'm looking for Christian women to be mentors of these women from the Middle East that we're going to bring in to do this program. We're going to pair them each with a corporate woman. And I just remembered you from this book signing, and I thought maybe you would want to do this. Well, we end up having this great conversation. I said, by the way, are you married yet? After we talked for a while, and she's like, no, I've been so discouraged. Well, I was pouring into her about that. And we just start this amazing relationship. She asked me to be a mentor. I signed up to be a mentor. We had a couple more conversations. And one day I said to her, by the way, are you going to do anything for these women from the Middle East about their purpose? Because I don't know if you'd be interested in it, but I do this session on how to write your purpose statement. Go fishing. 
throw your ideas out there. What does it hurt? You always feel like, oh, I shouldn't say anything. You know, I don't want to be. No, throw it out there. And she's like, well, tell me more about that. Do you know I ended up not only that year doing my purpose workshop in addition to being a mentor, but when they flew us over to Egypt to work with the Middle East women that were there on site, she asked me to co-facilitate the entire day's meetings with all the mentors. And all. See, when you put yourself out there, and you stir the seed, water the seed, you, you just can't even imagine what God will do. And I tell you this because it's so easy at this age of mine for people to read my resume and think, well, wow, she's just super talented. All the right connections, all the right things. That could not be further from the truth. Whatever talent I have, God has given me. But I did learn some techniques along the way that have helped position me to rise. See, I'm no different than you. And with the right people asking the right questions and teaming up with those that are in the rising tide, you will watch your dreams soar. The higher you rise, the more careful you must become in who you're doing life with. There are friendships that have seasons. Now, I never let go of any friend. But there may be people I'm just not hanging out with as much anymore because they just don't understand my season as a speaker, as a pastor's wife, as a mom of toddlers. I mean, most of my friends, their kids are all grown. That doesn't mean they're not still my friends, but I need young people who are raising children. And interestingly, God's brought me all these young pastor's wives who I just adore. And they kind of look to me for mentoring, but man, we're doing life together when it comes to raising toddlers. So you find who you need for the season. It also means that as a leader, I get asked so frequently to mentor people. And I love to mentor, but I tell people, I've got a whole team of leaders at both our churches and in my professional life that I feel directly responsible for. But guess what? I'm going to find someone that can help you. Or here's some other ideas. Don't be offended. If you go to someone and they don't have time for you or they, they can't fit you in, don't take offense. Just be glad that you've got shepherds like Pastor Chad and Marla who may not be personally able to mentor you every single week, but they're going to do their best to position you and to bring in people like me who just might trigger something in you that can mentor you in the moment and give you the confidence to go get what you need. They're amazing shepherds, not because they personally know every piece of your business, carry every one of your prayer needs, have the bandwidth to be, be in tune and know everybody's names and all your kids and all your kids' birthdays. I mean, people expect so much from their pastors. But when you get clued into what I'm talking about this morning, it's so exciting because your networks just keep growing and growing and growing that woman, Charity, that brought me into the Women's Initiative, she and I had dinner together in New York just two days ago. We do life together on so many things. And God wants you to have no less. I want to pray, pray for you. We're getting ready to close. This has been much more, as, as Pastor Marla said last night, I wanted to do much more of a teaching session this morning. And I want you to think about is there one or two ideas this morning that you feel excited about maybe giving it a try? I want you to get that in your mind and get that defined. I came up a couple years ago with a strategy that I call the one, one, one strategy. Did anybody ever hear me talk about this before? Remember what it is? The one, one, one strategy. You ready for it? It's going to help you. One dream, one step, once a week. One dream, one step, once a week. Now, what that means is you take the one idea that got really triggered for you this weekend, and this week you're going to carve out time to do one step forward toward that dream. Maybe your dream is I need a dream team. So 10 minutes sometime this week, you're going to take one step, write an email to the first person, or have a conversation. In fact, if you can do this by the end of day tomorrow, do it. If you could do it by the end of day today, do it. Send a text. Do whatever. Set out your step. One dream, one step, once a week. Ten minutes once a week is all it takes. Because at the end of the year, you will have taken 52 steps towards your dream. And you know what's going to happen? As you make those steps towards your dream, maybe now when you do a night of television, you're only going to watch one Netflix show. And not the marathon of five shows. 
I'm not being critical. I'm just saying that when your dream starts infiltrating where you're going, it will push aside wasted time. I'm guilty of it. I waste time. It'll push aside the distractions. It'll push aside the bad things. It's like when my girlfriend said, if you want to eat healthy, quit trying to get rid of everything bad. Just pull in one good thing to your diet because you'll be full from that and not want the other stuff. That's what we do with our dreams. One, one, one. One dream, one step, once a week. And when every one of us in this room become alive with our dreams, oh, you watch and see what God's going to do. It is going to be powerful. And when you're a woman of God, you are pregnant with dreams. You are pregnant with ideas. I mean, constantly when someone says, what you've been doing lately, it'll be on the tip of your tongue. Do you know what you need next to advance your dream? You got to know what you need next because God is going to be bringing people, bringing tides in, bringing circumstances. You got to know what you need because when, when it presents itself, you'll be articulate. I've been thinking about doing blah, 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 and you'll be able to say it in a minute or less. Here's what I need. Here's what I'm working on. And once you do the one thing, you'll know what you need next. Anybody into it? You want to do it? Stand to your feet. I want to pray for what one of the gifts is when we're a woman of God, and that is the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, which adds its emphasis to what I just talked about. I talk about these things in corporate America a lot in secular settings, but what I get to say when I'm with women like you is now we're going to receive from the Holy Spirit the supernatural part of doing what we can't do in our own flesh. Let's pray. Just, if you feel led, raise your hands again. Lord God, represented in these faces are a whole host of new dreams. Some of us, boy, we know what those are. Others of us, maybe we're at a juncture today, God, where we need you first to even show us what dream to even think about. Lord, I thank you that in the next 24 to 48 hours, that you're going to start blowing a wind on dreams. In fact, there are just some dreams that have been dormant for a lot of years while you've been so faithful in doing what you were called to do. God, take your Holy Spirit and blow a wind. Ooh, I feel it right now in this atmosphere. Just blow a wind on these dreams. Come alive, dreams of God. Come alive, wind, blow. Come alive, no more doubt and unbelief. In fact, I just speak to you spirits of doubt and unbelief. And I cast you down in Jesus' name. I cast down every stronghold in your thinking, every stronghold in your body, every stronghold in your surroundings. I come against every relationship sent by the enemy to defer you, to discourage you, to pull you down. I silence the lip of the accuser. He cannot speak to you death when God is breathing life. Now, God, there'll be no aborted dreams. There'll be no miscarriages. There'll be no early deliveries. There's going to be full-term delivery of these dreams, God. One year from today, mark my words, Destiny Outreach Women, you will be amazed what God is going to do with you and through you and for you. It will be so beautiful that only God could have done it. Now, Lord, we just simply say yes. <coughs> Sometimes we say just simply what Mary said. Let it be done to me as thou hast spoken. Say that with me. Let it be done for me as thou hast spoken. Let it be done for us, God. Let it be done for us. Lord, why not us? If, you got, if your eyes are looking to and fro across the earth, finding those whose hearts are fully yours, then God, I simply raise my hand and say, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me, God. Like Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Send me, God. Send these women. Send my friends. And we'll be careful to give you all the glory for our story. In Jesus' name, amen.